Washington Grown is brought to you by the Potato Farmers of Washington. Learn why Washington is home to the world's most productive potato fields and farmers by visiting potatoes.com. And by the Washington State Department of Agriculture, supporting the viability and vitality of Washington agriculture. And by Northwest Farm Credit Services, supporting agriculture and rural communities with reliable, consistent credit and financial services today and tomorrow. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Gordson and welcome to Washington Grown. It takes a lot of hard work to grow and harvest fields like you see here behind me. And that's why farm workers are so important to Washington's growers. Today we're going to be sharing the stories of two farm families chasing the American dream here in the Columbia Basin. I'm meeting with Frank and Steve, who started their relationship as farmer and farm worker, and today have become good friends. I'm here with two legends in the farming industry here in More Washington. More appropriately, we're old. <laughs> I didn't say that. And I'm making potato gnocchi at Tavolata. Kind of cone-shaped. Yeah, well then you can always just go in there yeah. and fix that up. Then, Tomas is getting a tour of Grand Coulee Dam. It provides water for 11,000 farms, grow everything from alfalfa to zucchini. All this and more today on Washington Grown. It's hard when you're as short as I am. Come and see Christy. <laughs> it's like I can taste the sunshine. Cheers. Bring it in. Bring it in. Oh. The calories are adding up. No calories in this. Thing. You don't get to do this every day. Looking for that hot new spot in Spokane? Look no further. Although restaurateur Ethan Stoll has a number of incredible restaurants in the Seattle area, the addition of Tavolata in downtown Spokane is making foodies on the east side of the state very happy customers. The whole environment and the vibe of Tavolata is unlike anything else in Spokane. It's very like rustic and industrial. They have a really great happy hour. I will absolutely be coming back. Spokane was a long time coming. Yeah. Scott Siff and his wife Tanya run Tavolata Spokane. After many years working for Ethan Stoll, they're excited to bring these concepts to this side of the state. You know, we really want to get into a community and showcase the community itself. And I think Spokane is a perfect location for that. Oh my God, it's amazing. Pretty like chill and relaxed, but very enjoyable. The way they played it is absolutely beautiful. and is really delicious. You know, we just have a lot of fun with it. We really try to be approachable. We don't want people to walk in and feel like, oh, it's a stuffy Italian restaurant. We're really about family and, you know, just doing good food and having a good time with it as well. Don't miss later in the show when Chef Scott and I make a special summer potato gnocchi. Little potato pillows of love. Exactly. The Columbia Basin Project is one of the most pivotal pieces in keeping our agriculture systems in Washington so vibrant and alive. From potatoes to garlic, the water brought to our farmers helps produce some fantastic products. Today, we're visiting one of the most important pieces of the Columbia Basin Project, the magnificent Grand Coulee Dam. Without the benefit of having Grand Coulee Dam here, we wouldn't have irrigation for the Columbia Basin Project, we wouldn't have power generation. Nick Simos is the Supervisor Reclamation Guide for Grand Coulee Dam. Now, although he sees this view every day, it never stops impressing him. Grand Coulee Dam is probably one of the coolest features in Washington. I mean, is it safe to say? I mean, this thing is massive. It is. At one time, it was the largest structure in the world. It's uh, 12 million cubic yards of concrete. It produces over 6,000 megawatts of energy. And if you look down there, the Nat Washington plant has six jumbo-sized generators in it. And with only two of those, it's enough to power a city the size of Seattle, Washington per day. Per day? Per day. So this thing is producing a lot of power. It is, yep. In addition to power, Grand Coulee Dam has drastically changed the landscape of agriculture here in Washington. The dam is a, a multifunction project. Uh, we have the pump generation plant essentially drafts water out of Lake Roosevelt and pumps it into a reservoir called Banks Lake. And that provides irrigation water for the Columbia Basin project. It, provides water for, uh, I think, 11,000 farms. 
to grow everything from alfalfa to zucchini. So our Washington farmers are completely benefiting from this. 100%, yep. <laughs> yeah. Now Nick and I are taking a walk up to Banks Lake, where water is kept in a reservoir to be distributed all across the state. So this is the main feeder canal coming out of Grand Coulee. So this canal feeds into Banks Lake, which is the main reservoir for the irrigation of the Columbia Basin Project. So some of the water from Lake Roosevelt that's being built up is being channeled back up through this canal. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's pumped 280 feet uphill. Today, the dam provides power for 11 states, some of Canada, and can even provide power as far as Mexico. But when the dam was first under construction, that wasn't necessarily the plan. So they originally started out with wanting to create power as well as irrigation, but that power was only gonna be supplied to the local area. Oh, okay. It wasn't until World War II, then they decided to expand that amount of power and just really ramp everything up. So when it comes to an important piece of Washington State, Grand Coulee's in the heart of it for a reason. It is, and it's a long history. Although power generation is an amazing benefit of the dam, its original purpose was strictly agriculture. The original purpose for the dam was irrigation. Okay. Uh, power generation just happens to be an added benefit. So this is what it's all about right here. Now, we're headed to the feeder tubes, where water is brought up from Lake Roosevelt below and then deposited into Banks Lake. I can feel the rumbling. That vibration you're feeling is all that massive amount of water, billion gallons per day, getting pumped up. They start down in the pump generation plant, about 280 feet below. And all that water is going out to the Columbia Basin, uh, supplying about 11,000 farmers. That's a lot of water, generating a lot of power. Yes, <laughs> yep. Well, if this isn't one of the coolest pieces of infrastructure I've ever seen, and probably one of the most important in our state. I mean, it seems pretty crucial to everything that we're doing. Yeah, we were pretty pivotal here. Yeah, indeed. So thanks for showing me around. Thanks for teaching me a little bit about how a dam really functions and its role in uh, our farmers. Well, thank you for coming out. Thanks Appreciate a lot, man. It. Hey, let's go. What goes better together than beer and french fries? I can't think of much. Today, we're in Mount Vernon at Farm Strong Brewing and Tap Room to see how they're marrying two of Washington's greatest products. We don't try to do anything super fancy, but everything we want to do, I tell my guys, just make it awesome. Owner Todd Owsley decided that the brewery needed a food truck, so he started Rooted Kitchen. You know, the first four or five years, we had a number of food trucks kind of coming through. We always knew that we wanted to have our own, control the menu, the service, the quality, and, and kind of just bring it all in-house. Time to try their specialty, the Washington-grown Asada fries with sirloin steak, Skagit beer cheese, and chimichurri. That is a pretty plate. Well, it starts with the Washington-grown potatoes. There it is. Get a little bit of everything. That is the way to do steak and potatoes right there. What a better thing to go with Asada fries than a good old beer. Viva la raza! <laughs> Cheers. Time to see what other people think of these Asada fries. Those are very yummy. Extremely fresh. I may need a napkin, please. I just like that it has all the good stuff. This is like a loaded baked potato. <laughs> right. It's all the things I like about nachos and fries together. <laughs> this right here is a meal. That says anything. I took a second bite without even saying I know, anything. I didn't even have to ask you. You wait for it. I definitely put a poutine in my mouth. <laughs> So how many tons of potatoes can you harvest with one harvester in one day? That's a question, and I'll have the answer for you after the break. Coming up, I'm making potato gnocchi at Tavolata. Cone-shaped. <laughs> yeah, well then you can always just go in there yeah. and fix that up. And we're in the kitchen at Second Harvest trying out some potato pancakes. The answer is you can dig up to 700 tons of potatoes in one day. Long day. <laughs> it has to be a long day. We're back at Tavolata in Spokane. Unique cocktails, fun atmosphere, and stunning dishes are just a few things that make this spot the perfect stop for anyone looking for a unique Washington experience. I absolutely love this place. It's like my new Spokane favorite. You can tell when you're having the food that it's fresh. Seems like they have a lot of good options for different food, appetizers, and drinks. What is the experience that you want people to have when they come here? Yeah, uh, we really kind of leave that up to the guests. Tanya Sif and her husband Scott run Tavolata Spokane. They want to make every customer feel welcome regardless of what kind of experience they're expecting. We, I think, kind of pride ourselves in being able to give 
whatever experience yeah. you're looking for. You could come in, have a dinner with you know six friends, enjoy some bottles of wine, but you could also just come in for a quick snack as well. The whole atmosphere is really positive. I'd say it's like a really classy, kind of laid back place to dress up, go out with your friends. It's super different from any other Spokane restaurant I've noticed. We definitely try to make things that are really approachable but have an interesting spin on them at the same time. If you were in Italy, they would showcase the products that they yeah, have there. Of we are obviously in the Pacific Northwest, so we do have really awesome produce out here, really good beef, pork. And so what are you and I going to make? You know, right now it's summer, uh, we want to create that summer seasonal vibe. So yeah. we're gonna do a potato gnocchi with uh, zucchini, yellow squash, and corn. Four ingredients, really simple, but delicious. Delicious. Yeah. Oh, well, you had me at gnocchi, so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so we got some beautiful russet potatoes uh -huh. from Eastern Washington. Awesome. Why russets for gnocchi? So russet is a drier potato. When you work potato too much, it gets a little mushy. So we go with russet potatoes to just maintain the dryness. I see. They're also, you know, awesome potatoes. They're awesome, okay. Before we got here, Scott baked the potatoes at 450 degrees for two hours to soften them up. To start off, we scoop out the insides. Oh, I just ripped mine open. That works. <laughs> That's the beauty of That's this. The, yeah. you, you can mess it up and nobody <laughs> knows. Next, we run the potatoes through a ricer. So what this does is push it all through without it being worked too much. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. That's so cool. And you can see it's like a nice light yeah. texture. Very satisfying. It is. <laughs> now it's on to making dough. Scott makes a divot in the potato, puts an egg yolk in it, and adds a little flour. Instead of working this dough, we're just gonna kind of cut everything oh, into it. Okay. So now you can see it's starting to kind of stick together yeah. and form that dough, but we're not working it so much uh -huh. where it, it becomes wet and contains more moisture. We flatten the dough out and start cutting gnocchi pieces. Then we start rolling them. So this is a gnocchi paddle. So just take your fingertips, roll it once that way, then I'll do it twice. We'll take that one out of there. Oh, you don't like that one? No. Okay. <laughs> we got plenty more. If you don't have a gnocchi paddle, I've done them without plenty of time. It's kind of experimenting. Yeah. If, if you have a fork at home, great. You know, try to make it work. Give it so. a go. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of cone shaped. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you can always just go in there yeah. and fix that up. I don't know if I'm getting the hang of it, but. Well, we're gonna make it work. <laughs> yeah. We boil the gnocchi, and then it's onto the sauce. We start by cooking some zucchini and yellow squash, then add some corn and Parmesan stock and let it cook down a little. We add a little truffle butter, and then it's time for the gnocchi. To top it all off, we sprinkle on some Pecorino Romano cheese and a little chive. The colors are so beautiful. Yeah, it really, really represents summer well. Yeah, it does. And there you have it. They're so soft and yummy. <laughs> Not too difficult to do. You gotta put your love oh into it goodness. as well. Oh my goodness, that is delicious. Little potato pillows of love. Exactly. To get the recipe for Tavolata's potato gnocchi with summer squash, visit wagrone.com. Food has a way of bringing people together, and there's no better place to find farm fresh food than the Columbia Basin. I'm chatting with Steve Connors and Frank Martinez, who started their relationship as farmer and farm worker, and today have become good friends. I'm here with two legends in the farming industry here in Washington. More appropriately, we're old. <laughs> I didn't say that. This is spectacular. What? are we looking at? This is the product of how the agriculture world has changed over the years. All of this ground that you're looking at here on my right was cattle, sagebrush. Today, the valley floor has been well irrigated, bringing in crops like potatoes, alfalfa, onions, cherries, and wheat. To Frank, the landscape he remembers from his childhood has changed for the better. Frank, what do you see when you look out here? I see progress. My dad was an irrigator. He would bring me out here to help him change the water. Juan was the head guy out here, and he had this young son that followed around that spoke English, and he didn't speak a word of English as far as I knew. So anyway, when we wanted to find out something, we'd talk to Frank. I've always said that the reason I became a foreman at the age of 17 was basically because I could speak both languages. 
After a while, I uh, went out and struck strike it out on my own there. I did a little 35 acre field right across the road. And you stopped by and you asked me, what are you gonna do with those potatoes? I said, I don't know, I'm just gonna grow them. He said, go to Carnation and get a contract. So I did, that's what I've been doing since then. That little contract, you know, kept me going and kept me going up until till today, basically. The farmer-to-farm -farm worker relationship is important to both Steve and Frank. Without farm workers, none of this would be possible. We have to keep a good relationship with our farm workers, and we have to be fair, and we have to uh, pay them well. I have some drivers that fly up from Texas to drive semis and trucks for me. And back then, we grew up together in, 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 in our little town in Mexico, and I was always the leader. And one day here, not too many years ago, I heard him talking says, you know what, you know, he, he used to tell us what to do since we were little, and here we are now, 50, 60 years old, he's still telling us what to do. One thing I can assure you, there are no eyes in farming. There's a lot of we's. The relationship between people that are hands-on and people that are directing traffic, if you will, will always be bound together. If employers think they can do it by themselves, they're not around very long. Farm workers, don't necessarily want to take the financial risk, but they could not be developed without the help of the, of the, the worker side. So potatoes, why do they grow so well over here? Washington State. <laughs> we are truly blessed here by having reliable water. The Cascade Range shields us from a lot of frustrations with weather. And we used to sit around the table at dinner time with all these different growers from around the country. And the first thing that surprised me about this old couple from Maine is when they asked me how many barrels per acre we harvest. <laughs> he didn't know what to answer. <laughs> we go by tons. Yeah, we're like, everything we, we, we do is 20 tons, 30, 25, 30, 35 tons per acre. We're blessed. I mean, that's, there's no if ands, buts about it. Coming up, Tomas is sitting down with an agriculture lobbyist. Washington agriculture is incredible. We have over 300 yeah. different commodities in Washington state. One of my favorite things to grow in the garden is squash. One of the things that a lot of people don't know about squash is that it doesn't really like to have its roots disturbed. To move squash from the pot to the ground, I just put my fingers over the stems of my squash plant and very carefully I flip it over. You can see all my roots here. I don't touch them. I just put it directly into my planting hole like so without disturbing the plant. Now once you've got your squash in the ground, you wanna make sure that you give it ample water. If you're growing in a home garden, you wanna make sure that your squash plant has lots and lots of room because a happy squash is a huge squash. So make sure that if you're growing it in a raised bed, you grow it on an end where it can cascade over and grow out into your yard. Once you have as many fruits as will ripen during the course of the season, you'll actually cut the tips of that squash plant off, which is called pruning your squash. And so it'll encourage the fruits that are already set on your plant to ripen fully and hopefully by the end of the year you'll have some big beautiful pumpkins or winter squash that you can store away and enjoy all winter long. I'm in Olympia talking to Brianna Elsie, an ag lobbyist, to learn more about what she does to support Washington agriculture. I don't really know a lot about lobbyists and your role in Washington agriculture so this is a really cool educational moment for me. We're paid to know what good opportunities for the public to come in and engage. And so I really consider ourselves advocates more than anything, because if you know the process and you know where a bill's gonna move and where it's gonna live or where it's gonna die, where it can be amended, we can alert the public to those opportunities. And when you alert the public to those opportunities, you elevate their voices. Because me talking about farming issues doesn't come across as genuine as the farmer talking about farming issues, right? I'm not a political guy, I haven't paid a lot of attention to that sort of thing. So when I've always heard the word lobbyist, 
Like you said, it's in a media story that's always painted to be a little scary. That's not true though, right? I call those our parents' lobbyists or our grandparents' lobbyists. And so in the 90s, you had this big change in lobbying and a lot of transparency entered the picture. So every bill I work, um, every committee I go to, every dollar I spend, I report that every single month. And that's that level of transparency that didn't used to exist, you know, 50 plus years ago. Now, my understanding is that you live in Ellensburg, correct? We're in Olympia. <laughs> you, you commute every day? Well, I think that helps me be an agriculture lobbyist, actually, because okay. I live and work in rural life. I appreciate right. farm culture. And so I need to feel your angst over a specific issue. I'm not a farmer. My two sheep don't qualify me as a farmer, okay? <laughs> not so, even a small farmer. <laughs> right, not even a small farmer. So I really like to get dirty. I like to get on those farms. I need to hear what's bothering them. Washington agriculture is losing about two farms per week. Right now, that was the latest census data. So we really are hemorrhaging farms in the state of Washington. I mean, you have a new capital gains tax, um, a tax on income. So then you have all the carbon bills, like low carbon fuel standard, the cap and trade program. And then you have labor bills. I mean, labor has become a very hot topic in agriculture these days. Washington agriculture is incredible. We have over 300 yeah. different commodities in Washington state. We're talking about berries and shellfish and cattle and dairies. I mean, dry land wheat is so incredibly different different than, you know, the dairies of western Washington or berries up north. It's just so incredibly diverse and every one of those different commodities has a very specific issue about them as well that needs to be addressed. As long as we have agriculture that is so incredibly diverse with so many different commodities, high wage rates and very labor intense, this is just going to continually be the hotbed for labor in agriculture. Well, welcome to In the Kitchen. We're here at Second Harvest, where we get to taste some wonderful recipes from allrecipes.com and just a lot of fun. My taste tester is with me today, Tomas. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. And Chef Laurent, thank you. Thank you very much yes. for having me. It's always a great pleasure to see you again. Yes, and we love being here in Second Harvest. The food bank here does such good work. And their kitchen here is a teaching kitchen. And Laurent, you've been able to, to teach some cooking yes, classes uh, here before. I've a few, few cooking classes here. Yeah. There's a lot of people and uh, always been a, a great uh, uh, experience in my life. And. Uh, always good to, to give back to the community and it's very important uh, for, for us to do so. And this is our first episode, potatoes. It's all about potatoes. We love Washington grown potatoes. I don't think that there is a dish that's made with potatoes that I don't like. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm a, I'm a carb guy. Yeah, and, uh, a carb guy. You know, that's right up my alley, uh, potatoes. And, and just, uh, just a little Quick reminder to all the viewer that uh, well we eat potatoes because uh, because of a French man called uh, Antoine Parmentier in uh, 18, the 17th, 18th century who, who who made Europe eat potatoes. So thanks to the so, French. Uh, merci beaucoup, right? <laughs> merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> and have you ever done like potato pancakes or anything like that? Yes, yeah. base, you know, but uh, I'm excited to see that uh, recipe of uh, potato pancakes yes. and with zucchini. Yeah, so this is from TK Caterer. So let's find out how we make the Irish zucchini and potato pancakes.
Potato pancakes are just right up my alley. Right, and if you know the smell of hash browns, like that's kind of what I'm getting out of this right here. And they're crispy on the outside, which I love. That could be a full meal for the evening. Mm -hmm. you, you make your pancake, you throw a, a over easy uh, egg on top of that, a little piece of bacon. You know, sometimes there are good recipes that are uh, foundation based, and I think that could be a great foundation for all season kind of uh, pancakes. Yeah. You could do uh, shredded asparagus in the spring, carrots in the summer. So you keep the same base. You change the zucchini for another vegetable, but I think it's a great base. It's a great idea. Yeah. I went into this thinking it was going to be like a crispy hash brown, and that thickness of that pancake inside was a surprise. It is really good. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Washington potatoes. Anna says five stars, shared it with my coworkers and they loved it. And another comment says very yummy, easy to make. I did add some rosemary, mm. black pepper, and a little more salt. So like you said, it's a great base and you can just get all sorts of creative with it. If you wanna get creative, go ahead and make the recipe and then post it on our social media page like Facebook, Instagram, Tag Washington Grown so that we can see your creations and or go online and make some comments about uh, other recipes that you've tried. Maybe next time it will be your recipe that we will feature. Right, yeah. you never yeah. know. I know. I don't know if I liked it. <laughs> yeah. It's gone. Yeah, how about that? I don't think you liked it. <laughs> you know, I've been talking too much. Well, I need to eat. Better eat. <laughs> to get the recipe for potato pancakes, visit wagrown.com. As you can see, there's a special bond between farm workers and farmers all across Washington. That's it for this episode of Washington Grown. Thanks for watching.